picture of a, a chairperson of a, a, a human rights uh, uh, chair. Uh, there's a, a Ford Foundation human rights chair and a citizenship studies. Uh, not only that, uh, he has been uh, taking uh, classes for uh, our uh, students and uh, his uh, guidance uh, to students as well as the faculty uh, has uh, contributed quite significantly. And uh, when uh, I requested on behalf of NVJS to preside over uh, uh, this uh, uh, lecture, he uh, agreed and uh, uh, I am uh, uh, very thankful to his uh, kindness and uh, he, uh, I, uh, on behalf of NVJS, uh, heartily welcome uh, Honorable Justice uh, Altham uh, Kabir to this uh, Audience. We have enlisted as uh, Lawrence uh, Liang, a very eminent uh, scholar, a uh, huge visiting uh, scholar, Center for uh, South Asian Studies, University of uh, Michigan University, 2014. He was a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Anthropology Department of Columbia University, 2010 11. Then uh, he was a New India Foundation scholar. He was a he obtained a PhD from JNU on a Film Studies Department. He did his PG Diploma in Cultural Theory. did his LLM in Law and Development at University of Warwick. He was awarded a Best Outgoing Student by the Warwick Law School in 1998-1999. He graduated with a BA LLB degree from a National Law School of India University in 1998. Uh, he has uh, English honors in uh, English and literature uh, from uh, Bangalore. His uh, work experience is uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, he was uh, one of uh, the co-founders co of uh, Alternative Law Forum, where uh, he has been uh, working during the last 15 years. Uh, it is uh, a non-profit uh, organization which has uh, significantly contributed to the aspects of studies on uh, law, legality and power and uh, his areas of interest include justice system, criminal justice system, issues of uh, gender, disability, sexuality and uh, he has uh, uh, radical ideas as could be gathered from uh, his uh, writings and uh, the topic that he has uh, chosen for uh, today is uh, the legal shaping of uh, time and justice how justice and time are uh, interrelated about that uh, he would be speaking uh, we will be uh, having uh, perhaps uh, uh, some uh, original viewpoints about uh, the interaction between uh, time and justice especially in the Indian geographical condition how that factor is uh, uh, something uh, demanding for a uh, some new thinking about that perhaps uh, we will be able to get an uh, input from uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, Liang. In the audience uh, we have uh, members of uh, uh, KC Basu family, uh, persons uh, who have a lot of uh, reverence or respect towards uh, uh, Mr. KC Basu or uh, uh, relatives of uh, uh, Taushik Basu. Then we have very eminent uh, uh, advocates, very eminent uh, law professors and uh, uh, we have a uh, good number of uh, students, a uh, good number of uh, faculty members and uh, uh, members of uh, uh, public at large. Uh, although uh, there was a dwindling of uh, the student population because of uh, the last days of uh, uh, December. Still, it was uh, possible to have this kind of uh, audience. That's why we had to shift from uh, another uh, smaller room to a bigger hall. And uh, uh, that shows how uh, KC Basu lecture is uh, taken with uh, all seriousness. With this, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, all uh, and uh, uh, next, uh, I, I would uh, request uh, uh, Professor Kaushik Basu to uh, make some uh, opening remarks so that uh, that will be followed by uh, Professor uh, Dr. Lawrence Liang's uh, uh, endowment lecture.
Pues el próximo. Vice Chancellor Professor Ishwara Bhatt, Honorable Justice Altamas Kabir, Dr. Lawrence Liang, uh, distinguished uh, members of the audience, uh, students, professors. Um, it gives me just great pleasure uh, to be here today uh, for this occasion. Um, as Professor Bhatt mentioned, I unfortunately missed the last two KC Basu lectures. Apart from that, I've been here for each one of them. Uh, this was started um, 11 or 12 years ago with some initial discussion between me and um, uh, Professor Madhav Menon, who used to uh, um, be Vice Chancellor at that time. It's a very personal moment for me because today brings together three interests or influences of mine all together. It's named after my father, as was pointed out, um, Sri Keshav Chandra Basu. Uh, he was a remarkable man. I mean, I would, of course, as a son say that, but even otherwise, um, quite apart from the fact that he came from a very um, modest, in fact, poor background, trundled into law, almost absent-minded. He used to teach, give tuition, and very late in life, he started taking law courses became a lawyer, so almost as a second thought he managed to become a lawyer, then started working for a firm which he said he found it very difficult with bosses and all. Uh, very late in career he became a partner in a law firm and suddenly flourished his legal practice. So by his sort of 50s he had a flourishing legal practice, was doing extremely well. Uh, became a mayor of the city and then a speaker of the West Bengal uh, Assembly. Um, my father, more than these kinds of achievements, very late in life, making it in life, for me was a very major intellectual influence. Uh, actually, if I look back, um, uh, the three most important intellectual influences for me very early in life, one was someone whom I just read, Bertrand Russell, absolutely eye-opening when I began reading Russell in school. My PhD advisor, extremely distinguished person, Amartya Sen, very major influence. My father was also a very major influence because about Sen and um, uh, about uh, Bertrand Russell, all of you of course know, I feel when actually on Amartya Sen I should say that when we look back at today's history, from some time into the future, I feel he will stand out like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a major figure globally in the intellectual span. But about my father and his intellect, you would not, not know anything because he was a busy lawyer by the time I knew him. I came rather late in life. He was also busy as a mayor and a speaker. But when he was speaker of the West Bengal Assembly, there was of course every second day there was a crisis. Those were the last days of the uh, Congress party. After that, in 1967, the Congress would lose and uh, the uh, Communist Party would come in. So there was one crisis after another when he was a speaker. But there was one very unusual crisis while he was a speaker. I failed in the geometry exam in school. That crisis had my father very upset because he never took direct interest in my studies. But he said, geometry is such an easy subject, why did you fail? So the only time in my life I've had direct academic help was then, for about a month, my father used to pull out my geometry book, class 7 geometry book, quickly read through a couple of pages, and then explain to me Ryder's theorems with a lucidity which is as though he was nothing but a geometer, a completely crystal clear thinking. So that was my interaction intellectually directly with my father, but also dining table conversation. I could see that it was a mind with a great clarity, logical clarity. You know, he grew up in a background which was, as I said, he was actually very poor in North Calcutta. So none of the polish that you get in today's world. We remember as children, my sisters are here. So I can tell you, my father was going on maybe his first foreign tour 
This was to Canada for a meeting. He went as part of an Indian delegation. So very sort of raw, brought up in the bylanes of North Calcutta, arrives in Canada, Ottawa. A journalist comes up to him. And those days, Goldwater, Barry Goldwater, was running for American presidentship. This was in the early 1960s. Very controversial candidate to be president of America. So this person comes up to my father, the journalist, and says, Mr. Basu, tell, give us your opinion about Goldwater. My father had no idea about Goldwater. Anyway, he spoke for a while, and then this was reported later that this was a master Indian diplomat because he spoke about Goldwater without giving out his own opinion at all, didn't give out his hand at all. When my father came back to Calcutta, he told us what happened. My father had no idea who Goldwater was. <laughs> From the question, he said he sort of figured out either it's a recent scientific invention called Goldwater <laughs> or a person. So he had to give an answer which would fit both a scientific invention and a human being. And his answer went down as a masterly diplomatic answer where he did not give out his hand. That was my father. Um, he died in 1986 and um, we decided with my mother who was still there that it will be wonderful to have a lecture going. So that was my one major, as I said, there are three important confluence which today gives me great joy. The second one is my belief in the importance of law, not for human rights. We've got the Honorable Justice over here who's done distinguished work in human rights, extremely important. Not for social transformation, Professor Bhatt has worked on social transformation, those are extremely important. But often something that gets neglected is for good economic policy, you need also a modicum of understanding of the law. This in, in India is extremely deficient and I feel this has really harmed the quality of policy making in India. Think of United States, the first legislation on antitrust goes back as far back as 1890. The Sherman Act is an antitrust legislation and the way it was crafted was a masterly attention to how will markets function better? How will competition do better? Later on, in 1914, came the Clayton Act, which again adds on more to antitrust legislation with attention to markets must function and flourish. This was already the law is interacting with economic policy making and you will see the thinking that goes on because soon after 1914 in the United States there was a little bit of a concern that if you, all these laws are preventing collusion. You don't want firms to collude because if they collude they will exploit consumers. But they realized and this was a bit of a Machiavellian realization that if the firms can't collude, then in the export market, they can't beat their competitors. So by 1918 came another law in the United States called the Webb Pomerine Act. The Webb Pomerine Act says you can't collude in the United States. But if you're producing for the export market, you can get together and collude. So that you can beat the exporters through collusive tactics. So this is, whether good or bad, the moral part of it I'm leaving out. But it is the kind of intricate thinking that is going in. And later, there were economists, there was a Nobel Prize winner, Coase, Ronald Coase, who wrote on the interface between economics and law. I just feel in India we've paid too little attention and economics is poorer by not paying enough attention to law and we need to do much more with that. And this is a lecture, not that every lecture we do it on law and economics, it has been disproportionately by economists. I'm very happy that Lawrence Liang is here, that this lecture is meant to be a series that sort of enlightens us, not on law and economics, but law, also helping economic policy in the long run. And finally, the third is I discovered Lawrence Liang. I have to confess that till four years ago, I didn't know of the existence of Lawrence Liang. Then someone drew my attention to some of Lawrence Liang's writings and I was just totally bowled over by the polymathic character of the writing. Here was a person who was straddling over literature, over anthropology, over law, completely comfortably. 
and some of the writings are absolutely hilarious it's also very very funny so it was a very talented it was very obvious to me that here is a person who's very talented he's also been a social activist taking up positions on uh, uh, antitrust or not on antitrust sorry on patenting on copyrights on various kinds of open sourcing and the importance of that well on the nitty gritties of that i may have disagreements with him but it is very clear to me through my reading of his work that it is a very remarkable intellect in this sphere which travels actually has important implications for economics for society so law in the interface so i'm very very glad today that's the name lecture after named after my father it's in a broadly in a field which i think is deficient in india we ought to pay greater attention to and we have a speaker here today and for that i must thank the vice chancellor with whom also i actually today is the first meeting we've spoken on the phone exchanged emails and for taking all this initiative over the last year we met once before indeed but it has been all that was the endowment lecture by you that was my endowment lecture by me not here it was the it was sorry it was a gathering of economists correctly it reminds me nothing to do with law that was economists and calcutta university university was involved that's when we indeed met and but today after that after that my entire contact has been by email and telephone with him but the lecture series is doing very well um, uh, uh, dr nanda medha patkar during the last two years and i'm delighted that all of you are here for today's occasion thank you very much Honorable Justice Altamas Kabir, Professor, Professor Kaushik Basu, Vice Chancellor Professor Ishwar Bhatt, members of the faculty and distinguished guests. It's an incredible honor to be invited to deliver the 10th KC Basu Endowment Lecture. I'm humbled by the fact that I follow on a list of distinguished scholars, activists, and intellectuals whose work has inspired me for years, and I hope I'm able to do some justice to the legacy of this prestigious lecture. I don't come from a law and economics background, Though questions of economic justice has been central to my political and intellectual concerns, but given the importance of time in economics, I hope to be able to draw some linkages, which may be of interest to the discipline as such. It's also a pleasure to be back here at NUGS. I was here exactly a year ago, offering a course on Shakespeare and justice, uh, which was a very rewarding experience. And I see a number of my students here. Uh, my talk today is entitled. untimely justice the legal shaping of time and justice in one of the, the most famous reflections on time st augustine in his confession says what then is time if no one asks me i know what it is if i try to explain it to someone i no longer know what it is and what augustine says of time is also true of justice where we often have a strong intuitive sense of what is just but begin to meander into all kinds of conceptual and philosophical difficulties when asked to define a theory of justice so i'm acutely aware of the risk of bringing the two together but given how intertwined law and time seem to be conceptual confusion might be a small price to pay for a deeper engagement with legal temporality i started seriously thinking about temporal dimensions of justice earlier this year when i was traveling through the northeast and encountered the differential impact of indian standard time in the region It's appropriate that we're discussing this in Kolkata, where you already feel the vagaries of Indian Standard Time with the very early sunset. But by the time you reach the northeast, you experience it as caprice. The longitudinal time difference between the westernmost parts of India in Kutch and the easternmost parts in the Patkai Hills is approximately two hours. The effect of which is that the sun rises and sets much earlier than it does in the rest of the country. The journalist Shonjoy Hazarika describes the northeast as being stuck, trapped in a time zone that makes neither common sense nor social and economic sense. And while the creation of a single time zone has many rational reasons behind it, including the efficient coordination of transport and communication systems, administrative offices and governance, the creation of temporal homogeneity has differential consequences for those who live on the edges and the borders of time zones. it materializes itself via the sharp socio economic differences between the western and eastern parts of india it provides a specific spatial and temporal context 
to the idea of center and periphery. In the Northeast, five to six hours of daylight are lost by the time government offices and educational institutions open. And in the winter, this problem gets more accentuated and the ecological costs are very high, with a lot more electricity having been being consumed. Professor D.P. Sengupta of the National Institute of Advanced Studies claims that if Indian Standard Time were advanced by half an hour, we would save 2.7 billion units of electricity every year. And there have been many proposals debated over the years, including the introduction of daylight saving time in India, but none of these have met with any approval. Alongside the pragmatic reasons are, of course, political and symbolic ones. And given the region's long and violent history, the unstated assumption is that the grant of temporal autonomy is only the first steps towards the conceding of spatial autonomy. A year ago, the Chief Minister of Assam, Tarun Gogoi, frustrated with the decision of the center not to have a separate Northeast time, unilaterally decided that Assam would follow Chai Bagan time. Bagan time, or tea time, is a reference to an informal practice followed in tea gardens in Assam, which are an hour ahead of IST. It alerts us in a way to the fact that there is indeed a long history of the application of different time zones in India. We find evidence of this even in the Constituent Assembly debates on the 28th of December 1948, responding to an amendment proposed by Naziruddin Ahmed. Dr. Ambedkar asks what system of timing Ahmed had in mind. He says, is it Greenwich time, Standard time, Bombay time, or Calcutta time? This reference to Bombay time and Calcutta time reminds us of an interesting aberration in the history of Indian Standard Time. IST was instituted in 1905, but after IST had been adopted, Bombay traders found it difficult to convert to IST, and because the conversion to IST was sought to be effected at a time when there was considerable public sentiment over the Tilak trial, the sedition trial as a lot of the law students know, the government found a little support of this shift amongst the people in Bombay. The government shelved the conversion for Bombay and Bombay time was maintained right up till 1955, with Bombay following its own time zone, which was 38 minutes ahead of the rest of the country. While in Nagaland, I had discussions with people, including speculation about what a constitutional challenge on this question may look like, given the absence of political will to have two time zones. And we do not have too many precedents by way of case law on the question of standard time, but if you were to look at the US for a comparative perspective, you find all kinds of interesting parallels. In the US, battles over daylight saving time regularly went to the court, and it wasn't until 1966, with the passing of the Uniform Time Act, that you had a uniform national period of daylight saving time emerging. At its core, the creation of a standard time signals the victory of time over space, with geographical areas being brought under a single time zone rather than relying on local solar time. And the idea of a time zone, a standard time zone, has become so integral in our lives that we often take it for granted and assume it to be a natural phenomenon. We tend to forget the complex contestations that go into its making. And like any other normative systems, the chrononormative functions by invisibilizing its own structures of power and control. I use the phrase chrononormative following Elizabeth Freeman, who compellingly demonstrates how an idea of an ideal time is mobilized through legal and policy initiatives. These are often dictated by ideas of maximum productivity, whether in terms of the economy or in the private sphere. A 35-year-old single woman, regardless of what she does, how successful she is, is seen to be running out of time. An expectation of time that only makes sense within the patriarchal logic of temporality. The world of law is saturated with time, and it would appear that time is the invisible thread that runs through the entire legal system. But the thing about invisible threads is despite their omnipresence, we take them for granted and rarely bring them into legal theory. Todd Rakoff, for example, argues that legal, legal relationships define our conception and experience of time. For example, the statutory term of copyright or patent. Even as law and legal institutions are structured by our normative expectations of time, such as the length of punishment given to a criminal. And there is no better evidence of this than in the debate over the last week over the punishment given to the minor in the Nirbhaya case. And collectively, these constitute for Rakoff the laws of time. If you look at legal language, you find that it's saturated with temporal metaphors. Two of the most common ones that have almost become legal cliches include 
Justice delayed is justice denied and its opposite. Justice harried is justice buried. The tools of our trade, legal doctrine, rely on temporal concepts such as time is of the essence of the contract. And legal instruments like injunctions, which are either temporary or permanent, are essentially temporal instruments. I have begun with the question of standard time, which is perhaps the most literal example of the coming together of law and time. But it invites us to think about the philosophical intersections of law, time, and justice. If ideas of time fundamentally shape our experience of justice, what I'm interested in addressing today is how a reshaping of time and our imagination of it can become the basis for the invention of a new legal language of ethics and politics. And in this talk, I will pursue the following line of thought. First, I'll begin through a reading of Greek tragedy to lay out a legal theory in which law invents a particular idea of time, the future. I then turn to one specific instance of the legal future as it emerges in post-colonial constitutions. Then I ask how the law deals with the question of contingency as an eruption of time and what an untimely theory of justice might look like. And finally, using two contemporary urgent problems, I ask how a temporally sensitive theory of judgment can respond to the crisis of our times and invent a more hopeful future. I must also mention that, tempted as I was, I will not be addressing the question of linear versus non-linear time, one of the fault lines commonly attributed to the Western versus non-Western philosophies of time. It's an area that would require much more than 45 minutes to work through, and I'll never be able to match the fine thinking done on it by scholars like Pratima Banerjee. So let me begin with the idea of the legal invention of time. And for this, I turn all the way back to Aeschylus and to the Oresteia, two texts that have served as foundational myths of the Western legal system are Sophocles' Antigone and Aeschylus' Oresteia. While Antigone continues to be studied in jurisprudence as a text that pits kinship against the state and natural laws against man-made laws, there is considerably less attention paid to the Oresteia, which to my mind serves as one of the earliest texts to think through questions of legal temporality. The Oresteia is the only surviving trilogy in Greek tragedy which narrates the history of the House of Atreus. And even by the somewhat low standards of messed up families in Greek tragedy, the House of Atreus stands apart for the scale of its misfortune. And at the risk of doing grave injustice to Aeschylus and incurring the unforgiving wrath of the Greek pantheon, I have no option but to provide a crude summary of the play. So the background is this. Agamemnon, before leaving for the Trojan War, was forced to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia. After the war, Agamemnon returns only to be killed by his wife Clytemnestra as revenge for her daughter's murder. Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's son Orestes now has no choice but to avenge his father by killing his mother. And after killing Clytemnestra, Orestes is being pursued by the Furies, the angry goddesses responsible for avenging matricide. Now, this seemingly endless cycle of violence is finally brought to an end in the final play of the trilogy, The Eumenides. And it is in this play that we see the emergence of a very powerful image, the legal invention of time. At the heart of the play is a question of the relationship between time, memory and justice, and how we can end the cycle of revenge and violence. The Furies, literally the Avengers, demand blood for blood, and they threaten to wreak vengeance and havoc on the city if Orestes is not killed. They are slowly persuaded by Athena to give up their bloodthirst and be incorporated into a new system, a jury of citizens who will decide on crime and punishment. And after their initial reluctance, they eventually submit to her reason and participate in the establishment of a new legal system. The Oresteia sets the stage for the formal incorporation of primal passions into the legal system and the jury system that is established personifies the abstract aggregate reason of a citizenry, procedurally bound to a rule, not of passion, but of reason. Up to the final play, the story illustrates what might be called natu the, the natural history of justice, a cycle of destruction in which each act of violence feeds off the one before and nourishes the next. The humanities brings an end to the to the cycle and by forging a new institution for the operation of justice that can settle disputes within the framework of a legal system 
one that fosters the survival rather than the destruction of the human community. Now, as a legal parable, the Oresteia provides a very compelling account of the emergence of the legal system suggesting that the only way out of the cycle of violence is the establishment of a transcendental order that simultaneously institutionalizes the wisdom of the people, even as it instructs their moral character. But the question is, what is it that enables Athena to win over the Furies after they were hell-bent on killing Orestes? The answer is an image of time. An idea of the future, which is consciously invented by the law. Revenge as an instinct depends on a stubborn refusal to forget. And it freezes time under the sign of injury and trauma. Think of Hamlet, haunted by his father's ghost, a recurring memory of trauma that will not rest until justice is done. The cruel destiny of the Avenger is his fatedness to memory, even if it is an unbearable memory. An Avenger is unable to move forward in time until justice is done to the original act of violence and trauma. Vengeance, then, is an expression of a desire to set the world right through a reordering of time and to end the horror of memory that Aeschylus describes as a relentless anguish gnawing at the heart. So the justice of retribution is not just about restoring balance, but also about restoring time. But given the repetitive nature of violence, it ends up destroying rather than healing time. The legal invention of the future creates a redressal, which is not just in time, but also off time. And this enables us to think about the law, not only as a system of rules and orders, but as a chronometer that orders the experience of time through a conversion of private anger into the public memory of justice. The Oresteia, for me, can be read as a time machine that contains within it competing visions of time. And Aeschylus had a very keen sense of an agonistic temporal framing, a discursive process in which competing agents seek to undermine each other's understanding of the past and the future. So if for the Furies, justice consisted of a repetition of the past, it was one that was doomed to eternal recurrence. While for Athena and for the law, Justice is a projection of time into the future. In order to rescue memory from the clutches of a frozen time, Athena invents a new image of time, the future. And I will contend that this idea, the legal invention of the future, remains one of the most important tropes for thinking about the law not just as a system of force and sovereign violence, but as a social imaginary with creative and ethical responsibilities that responds to and reshapes social life. From the Oresteia, let me now turn to a very different site in which the law plays the role of inventing an image of the future, the post-colonial constitution. What I'd like to do is to offer a temporal reading of the post-colonial constitution as an example of a constitutional revolution in time. Like the previous constitutional moments that preceded it, including the French Revolution, the American Revolution, post-colonial constitutions are genus-faced. They bear the burden of undoing the violence of history, even as they construct an image of the future. In his reflections on the character of transmitted constitutions, Professor Pendra Bakshi argues that the founding of post-colonial constitutions respond to the histories and geographies of injustice by becoming a utopian blueprint of possible time spaces. And he finds evidence of this in Justice Pius Langlois' remarks on the South African constitution, where Laungla says, describing the South African constitution says, it's a historic bridge between the past of a deeply divided society, characterized by strife, conflict, suffering, and injustice, and a future founded on the recognition of human rights, democracy, peaceful coexistence, regardless of color, race, class, belief, or sex. Laungla adds, this is a magnificent goal for a constitution to heal the wounds of the past and guide us to a better future. And for me, this is the core idea of transmitted constitutionalism. He says that we must change. But how must we change? How does society on the other side of the bridge differ from where we stand today? The text of a constitution is therefore, in a way, a speech act which pledges a more equal and more just future as a kind of a promissory note of time.
It's a promissory note of a justice to come in time. But exactly how long does this future take to arrive? And how is the time of justice distributed across different classes? The history of minority struggles we know in a way is a rejection of an abstract idea of universal time, arguing instead for an experience of differential time. In the experience of race, caste, gender, and sexuality, temporality functions as a component of citizenship as powerfully as geography does. And the history of social and political movements is a history of the struggle against restrictions on three counts, justice, time, and space. If the history of working class struggles have been about the destruction of the partition of time, if slaves neither owned their own bodies nor their own time, and if workers sold their time and labor of their bodies to others, then the struggle of the working day is a struggle against the partition of time into work and leisure, between those who can enjoy non-productive time and those who don't. And in recent times, an increase in the interest in the archives of the writing of workers all testify to the fact that the history of leisure moments of subalterns is the history of stolen time as freedom time. Because what was owned was not just your bodies and labor, but time itself. And to experience your time as your own was to imagine the possibilities of freedom. The imagination of a freedom in time and from time constructs to my mind a very powerful political image from which a new vocabulary of rights and privileges can be created and existing relations be transformed. If you look a little closer at home in Indian literature and popular cinema, you find remarkable instances of a thinking of a temporal dimension of the constitution. Texts like Sadat Hassan Manto's New Constitution, Raj Kapoor's Avara, B.R. Chopra's Kanun are replete with piercing insights into the nature of time and justice. Raj Kapoor's Avara and Manto's Nayi Constitution ask what the new constitutional order means for denizens who have always existed outside the pale of the rights-bearing citizen. By inserting not the citizen, but the illegal citizen into the heart of constitutional imagination, these texts ask what it may mean to think of the arrival of the post-colonial moment of citizenship from the perspective of a constitutional underclass whose marginal social status constantly risks them being unconstituted. In these texts, the inaugural moment of the constitution does not guarantee that everyone will be recognized as citizens. And the history of political struggle in India can be characterized as one where individuals await to become citizens. And the experience of waiting has been a prominent marker of time for a large number of people, from the unfolding refugee crisis in Europe to people waiting for relief from natural or man-made disasters, or the persistent image of the litigant sitting outside in a court hall waiting for her case to be heard. This figure of someone waiting at the doors of law is of course one of the most powerful metaphors of justice that we've inherited from Franz Kafka. In Before the Law, we find the man from the country waiting for years only to be told by the gatekeeper, not yet, not yet. This then to my mind is another way of thinking about time, which in Hamlet's words is out of joint. If the Northeast was about being out of sync with time zones, then what happens to those who share a temporal experience of being in the same time zone and are yet precluded from time. Benedict Anderson's imagined community of the nation is predicated on a shared time between citizens within a geographic area. But if citizenship has conventionally been a spatial concept, it's also crucially a temporal con concept. The question of when some people become full citizens is an integral question of justice. When the Supreme Court in Suresh Kumar Kaushal overruled the Delhi High Court uh, decision in the Nas Foundation case and upheld Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, they effectively relegated sexuality minorities into a sphere of the not yet, not yet citizens. This tension in Indian constitutional history between the domain of social transformation and political freedom is well documented by constitutional historians. And as various scholars have suggested that the temporal imagination of the Indian constitution differs from others insofar as it is framed within a moment of historic inequality in order to make the ideal contractual moment possible only in the future. Now, what do I mean by this? In her work on emergency laws, 
Jayanandita Kasi Bhatla makes a very provocative argument where she says this logic of deferral can be traced to the invisible presence of the partition in the Constituent Assembly debates. She provocatively argues that even though the partition was never memorialized in India in the form of museums or memorials, it was memorialized in the discussion of emergency laws in the Constitution. She finds the partition to be the spectral presence that haunts the Constituent Assembly debates on national security and emergency powers, such that the result of this incorporation of the historical crisis into its framework creates a citizen effect of infinite deferral. The emergency swallows the conception of the present moment in history by isolating it under the sign of a crisis, the time which is out of time, with no end in sight. And this, to my mind, is a crucial way of thinking about how, even as constitutions are simultaneously utopian moments, they are also contained within it the possibilities of their own undoing. And this gap that exists between the moment of its becoming and its institution as a finished process is also a temporal one. A difference that political philosophers term as constituent power and constituted power. Antonio Negri names constituent power as a moment of the origin of the political, an open horizon of possibilities before it gets formalized into political forms that focus more on their self-preservation than on the idea of the absolute potential. And this idea of the absolute potential for someone like Negri is connected very critically to an idea of the love of time. And he writes this very beautifully when he says, the political is the horizon of the revolution not terminated but continued, always reopened by the love of time. Every human drive in search of the political consists in this, in living an ethics of transformation through a yearning for participation that is revealed as a love for the time to constitute. To take away this element from the political means to take everything from it. I read in Negri an appeal to an ethics of time which does not foreclose the possibility of reinvention even after a constitutional revolution. Many of the sharpest ideological divides that we see in India today, for example, on questions of economic development models, needs to be seen as agonistic temporalities in which two visions of time and the future are played out. And a commitment to democracy requires a commitment to competing visions of the future. If the law is used to crush dissent or weed out competing visions through the language of anti-nationalism and anti-developmentalism, then we do a disservice not just to the principles of liberty. We foreclose the possibility of a love of time and of its necessary handmaiden contingency. The critical tension between constituent and constituted power is nothing if not the attempt to enfold contingency within a homogeneous idea of time and law, which has the potential of inventing time, then becomes the gatekeeper of a very particular idea of time consigning any other possibilities of time into the not yet, not yet. So what I'd like to do is develop a theory of, of the relationship of justice to the contingent as what one would describe as an untimely theory of justice. The idea of the untimely comes to us via Nietzsche. And Nietzsche's key insight was to develop a dynamic philosophy of time that did not subsume time to the past or to history alone. For Nietzsche, we needed a theory of history or a form of reading the past, not just in light of the present, but for the future. For Nietzsche, being trapped by the past constrains the present within the terms of what is knowable. And in an untimely history is one that thinks the impossible and anticipates the future. At the same time, of course, he was aware that an ignorance of the past could only produce a vacuous experience of the present. And in this paradox lies the greatest possibilities of thinking the untimely. Nietzsche's philosophy of history requires of us an ability to think in a manner that allows us to grow both young and old simultaneously. So in what manner may we think of the untimely in relation to justice? If, as many of you know, the entire edifice of common law is based on an adherence to precedence, it is a system that's grounded in time, and legal meaning is dependent on temporal meaning-making. Law derives its authority from the past, even as it has to address itself to the present and anticipate the future by providing a normative expectation of how law will be decided in the future. In a sense, 
The task of judicial interpretation is very much that of someone who weaves legal meaning across time, stitching together individual points of time to each other. And if we see the untimely as a form of eruption in time, a contingency that makes its claims upon the present, we begin to see how legal systems, particularly the common law system, which is grounded in a practice of memory and repetition, can be confronted by claims to justice as an act of eruption. If the corpus juris or the body of law resides in the legal archive of all cases that have been decided, then how can a judge encounter a new fact or phenomena as a contingent event? In most cases, judicial interpretation takes place along the lines of what one would call a dogmatic image of law. But every once in a while, there is a moment in which it invents something. This is really in some ways the freedom of the common law, the freedom to deviate, to dissent, and to create new law. It is in a way an institutionalized line of flight or an escape from the strictures of law. But for the judiciary to exercise their freedom, they need to do it in a way that's grounded in a philosophy of time and of creativity. While fidelity and integrity of interpretation have been the traditional values in determining the quality of legal interpretation, in what manner may creativity be an evaluative criteria? How can we define an ethics and an aesthetics of creativity in legal judgment? By treating the singularity of a single case as a contingent encounter, a force, if you like, which compels us to create from it the conditions of justice as it applies to the case before it becomes a universal principle, how can we imagine, in a way, a much more fidel relation to the question of time and the invention of the future? Now, legal formalists and pragmatists would argue that this could potentially create a very unstable system in which predictability, one of the virtues of a formal legal system, would be imperiled by the subjectivity of individual judges. And yet, without a political and ethical creativity, would we have had a Roe versus Wade in the US or a Menika Gandhi versus U a Union of India uh, here? So where law faces an impasse, maybe we need to turn to other arts of time, which take the same impasse as the criteria of possibility. In a spectacular move, Sarah Ramshaw, who is both a legal scholar and a jazz musician, brings together her two interests and offers us a fascinating insight on how the imagination of justice and judgment may greatly benefit from an engagement with improvisation in jazz. She reads judicial interpretation alongside the history of jazz performances to develop a theory of the law of the extempore and justice as improvisation. In jazz, as we know, timing is everything. And the greatest jazz musicians are those who listen to what precedes them with a keen ear so as to be able to improvise and create something not heard before. Ramshaw begins by arguing that improvisation is far from the extempore event that we deem it to be. And to appreciate the extemporary nature of improvisation, we need to understand how tightly bound it is within a system of conventions that constantly restrains it. The improvised act can only make sense as improvisation within a pre-existing or prevailing laws of language. Now, if you were to link the relationship between improvisation and tradition to questions of judicial interpretation, it's very similar to how one encounters the contingent the singularity of a case, on the one hand, as an inaugural event, a first time ever. And yet, if the first time ever is absolutely unique, it would also be the last time. And that would erase the possibility of it being recognized as improvisation. It is in its iterability, through its repetition and alteration, that makes the originality of improvisation possible in the first place. And in that sense, improvisation and law share the same structural tension in that their meaning rests on the relationship between singularity and generality, repetition and alteration. And legal ethics emerges precisely at that creative negotiation between these planes. So building on an ethics of improvisation, Ramshaw would argue that it's the ethical responsibility to the other which lies at the, at the heart of creativity. The nature of improvisation inheres a inherently from an attitude of openness as well as of obligation. This idea of justice as improvisation, to my mind, reimagines justice as a species of, of temporal imagination. 
And the role of the judge is like that of the musician, as a keeper of memories that recalls the legal archive and all the points that can connect to the surface that is presented in the case. But this archive is virtual until upon in a particular case. Its existence in time can be cast, therefore, in almost Bergsonian terms, as a past that also passes through the present and the future. For me, the, con the consequences of this conceptualization of time is that for a judgment to be, it has to be rooted in legal memory, but a memory that can also be transformed through the contingency of an encounter. In other words, yes, it is necessary to judge. Yes, it is necessary to decide. But to judge well and to decide justly, that might be a music lesson that can also be learned from the ethics of jazz. I began my talk with one puzzle, the standardization of time and how it reveals to us the invisible presence of law of time in our lives. I then moved to a specific image of the law as an invention of time and the future. After which I looked at the moment of the post-colonial constitution and its imagination of time. I argued that we need a theory <clears throat> of untimely justice that allows the law to uh, retain its relationship to its constituent power and not be subsumed within the temporality of a constituted power. And now in conclusion, I'd like to offer two urgent and interrelated problems from contemporary life that demands, to my mind, an innovative theory of law and time. And the two issues for me are the question of environmental ethics and the question of intergenerational obligation. And the second is the question of illness and the ethics of care. The issue of intergenerational obligation has become a critical issue of our times, especially in light of the disastrous ecological consequences that we are living with, much of which have arisen from choices that involve a rapacious consumption of natural resources at a rate which very seriously threatens the very idea of a possible future. So if the law is responsible for inventing the future, in what manner may it invent a future at a time when we threaten the very possibility of the future? This problem manifests itself both as an aspect of time. If we continue to consume in this manner, then what happens to future generations, as well as of geography, while advanced countries and economies have historically benefited from the exploitation of natural resources, is it fair to expect countries like India and China, who are late comers, to bear the burden of environmental disasters? Now, in the year of globalization, it becomes a little more complicated to speak about this exclusively in spatial terms, and we are aware of the presence of the global north in the global south and vice versa. But regardless, the question is an urgent one and a philosophically complex one, which legal scholars have puzzled over for quite some time now. It involves answering difficult epistemological and moral questions, or as Robert Hockett describes it, the who, what, and how of intergenerational obligations is far from clear. And while that may remain the case for a while, the question of why, why even think of intergenerational obligations cannot be avoided any longer, and returns us squarely to the question of temporality and to the question of untimely justice. If certain received ideas of life, the legacies of modernity, have remained unquestioned for a long time, we now know that we have no choice but to confront them. They are, in a sense, the eruption of the untimely in our present. And the question is, how can the law respond? My second example is a question of illness, and to a certain extent, advancing old age. We are already witness to an epidemic of illnesses in our times, and it's difficult now to speak to anyone who hasn't had some form of terminal illness, especially cancer, visit them, their families, people they love. And even though illness is a great equalizer in that it does not distinguish between the rich and the poor, like everything else, the effects and consequences of illness are distributed in an unequal manner and a large section of the population who already lead extremely precarious and vulnerable lives the visiting of a serious illness upon them becomes a matter of extreme suffering in which a broken public health system and an archaic legal system conspire. The one to ensure that you cannot live with, di with dignity and the other to ensure that you cannot die with dignity. Why do I choose these two problems as a way of thinking about untimely justice? Both of them share to my mind an untimely quality. The consequences of global warming, whether as floods tsunamis, and illnesses either arrive too early or we are warned too late. But they also share something else. At the heart of both of them, we see a picture of fragility. A picture of fragility that ought to be the basis of a new political and ethical imagination. 
In the last decade or so, we've seen a heightened awareness of a new language and understanding of ecology in which we've finally begun to take baby steps out of the hubris of placing man at the center of and as the measure of all things. So I want to think about this idea of fragility in relation to the future. In his essay, The Storyteller, the German philosopher Walter Benjamin, writing in the aftermath of World War I, noticed the gradual disappearance in the art of storytelling and consequently the ability to share experiences. He says, after the end of the war, when soldiers returned home, they had lost their ability to share experiences and they returned silent. People had come back from the war not enriched but poorer in experience. And for Benjamin, he says, for never has experience been contradicted more thoroughly than strategic experience by tactical warfare, economic experience by inflation, bodily experience by mechanical warfare, and moral experience by those in power. A generation that had gone to school on a horse-drawn streetcar now stood under the open sky in a countryside in which nothing remained unchanged but the clouds, and beneath these clouds in a field of, field of force of destructive torrents and explosions was a tiny, fragile human body. Writing from the debris of the war, Benjamin's storyteller is for me simultaneously a document of despair and a document of hope, in which he calls upon us to pay closer attention to forms of life that are being rendered obsolete. And his metaphors of the destructive torrents and the fragile human body speaks directly to the two problems I have identified. The scale of some of these problems have a tendency to overwhelm even the most optimistic amongst us. And the greatest danger of bad policy choices is that they destroy our capacity to have hope. So the sight of hope itself becomes a vital arena in which struggles will have to unfold. A thinker wisely observed that hope is precisely what we maintain against evidence to the contrary. The legal invention of the future is not just the creation of a system of governance in time. What is at stake is the invention of a utopian and practical vocabulary of hope, which like the jury in the Oresteia, institutionalizes the wisdom of the people, even as it instructs their moral character. And big thing with the fragile or the injured body, whether of an individual or a body politic or indeed the state of the world, is to my mind one way of thinking of an untimely justice and the role that law will have to play in that invention of the future. If our constitutive moment, unlike the moment of decolonization, which begins and was grounded in the nation, is one in which a global collective begins with vulnerability rather than hubris, collectivity rather than individuality, then metaphors of illness and codependence have the possibility of inventing a different sense of time that we will need to inhabit. There is an aspect of the injured body that brings us out of our self-absorption and our complacency that demands that we relate to each other and above all compels us to act responsibly, ethically, in the presence of each other. And law has always been present at the sites of injury and it is very often in fact set into, moment, into motion at the point of injury, at the moment of damage to which it responds. Our normative worlds are created or recreated in moments after immense destruction. And as Robert Cover reminds us, a legal world is built only to the extent that there are commitments that take place, that place bodies on the line. And this challenge of the law responding to a challenge thrown to it by time is not peculiar to us. If you look at the early 20th century and the immense changes brought about by two things, war on the one hand and industrial accidents on the other, thought law is a good example of how law invented a legal category of responsibility to address new risks but also to name new injuries. So if you look at the two principles of emotional distress on the one hand and a duty of care on the other that emerges, both of them come to name emotional injuries that no longer had a physical you know, kind of a surface, even as it names accidents and injuries caused by machines and not by humans to each other. At its core, the duty of care is both a pragmatic principle, but also one that covers some of the most deeply ethical visions of what an ethic of care might be. And the legal invention of principles in this instance is an example of how the law may respond to time and to do justice to it. If we take the idea of responsibility first and foremost as the ability to respond, our responsibility, what would an act of judging responsibly 
in the face of time mean? And how can juridical judgment develop a theory and a love for time? Judgment is a temporal resolve. It acknowledges the rights of those who are present, makes an appeal to the past, and invents the future. Living as we do in the early decades of the 21st century, with all kinds of new risks and dangers, we similarly need a renewed commitment for the future, which provides us hope against all evidence to the contrary. And it's this twin responsibility to memory and doing good on the promissory note of the future that marks the time of a constitution and the courts that interpret it. I'd like to end with a quote from Jane Austen, who in Northanger Abbey says, let us not desert one another. We are an injured body. And I can think of no better starting point than this to imagine how the law will have to imaginatively invent a more, cons more caring conception of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence Liang. It was a brilliant exposition of our theory, philosophy, uh, geography, economics, and a whole adjudicative system. Uh, time is a, a continuous uh, flowing uh, stream, and it is not po possible to compartmentalize past, present, and future. Freedom in time and freedom from time constituted and uh, uh, constituent powers. All uh, dimensions uh, relating to the untimely aspects of justice, not only geographical aspects, about uh, various other aspects, uh, he made a, a brilliant uh, exposition. In fact, uh, when a law is a, a kind of investment, time is the medium in which uh, the investment uh, continues. And if there is a delay in a passing of uh, an economic legislation resulting in uh, some type of a loss to the society, perhaps uh, injustice arising out of that is uh, something uh, untimely. There's a concept of untimely justice uh, that he had uh, uh, propounded here is uh, in fact uh, a contribution uh, to the whole of uh, Keshe Basu Endometrial Lecture Series and uh, it is also an uh, uh, addition to the new thinking. Now uh, before uh, opening for a discussion, uh, let, uh, let us have formal completion of uh, this uh, formality. Uh, I request uh, my colleagues uh, to offer a bouquet to Lawrence uh, Liang. Uh, I request uh, Honorable Justice uh, Kabir to uh, felicitate with the shawl. I request uh, Professor Kaushik Basu to hand over a memento. I request uh, uh, to hand over a bouquet to Professor Kaushik Basu. And uh, Honorable Justice Honorable Justice Kabi. Now the forum is open for a discussion. Just before we open. Like I was saying, since I'm presiding over this particular meet in memory of Justice Casey Basu. I think I, I should also justify my presence here by saying one or two words. Not many, but just a few words. Taking up from where Dr. Lang ended. I would just like to quote a certain portion again 
from a person who was born in 551 BC. Who could that be? In China. Confucius? Well, there's a little poem that is not, it's not a little poem, it's a big poem, of which one can extract a little bit. And the extract would be, it goes like this. This is a proof of what was spoken by Dr. Liang and also to some extent by Dr. Koshik Basu, Professor Koshik Basu. If there is righteousness in the heart, there will be beauty of character. If there is beauty of character, there will be harmony in the house. If there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And if there is order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. This is Confucius writing two and a half thousand years ago. Look at the, the, the idea that he had in, in his mind. How to bring about peace? How to bring about peace on a worldwide region? Today, the countries of the world have come together so close because of the internet and other fast methods of trans transferring messages that today we have to think in terms of the world as a whole. We just cannot think in terms of one or two countries or our own country only. Professor Basu spoke about economics and law, the connection between the two. And I think this is something which everybody realizes that today the thinking of law has changed a great deal. Previously, like Dr. Diang uh, said, it was common law. It's not that today, today it's not, no longer just common law. Not only just precedents. Today, much of our laws are governed by statutes. The theory of innovation that has been suggested, look, this is not a debate, and I'm not saying anything else, but just trying to put forward my ideas in a couple of minutes. Today, innovation is something which is foreign to statutory law. If the statute says this is the law, then this is the law. Take for example the example given by Dr. Liang about the 16th December 2012 happening. After this, these seven people who were accused, six of them were convicted, all seven were convicted, sorry, and six of them have been given the extreme punishment. Why then does this minor get out? Why then does this minor who is below 18 years old, why does he come out of the entire scenario? As some of the journalists say, scot-free. That's not the case. He has not come out scot-free. He has served his term according to the law. The law says, a person who is below the age of 18 years, if convicted of even a heinous and grievous murder or crime, maximum punishment he can be given is three years. And there's a philosophy behind it. It's not that just like that it happened, that a certain age limit was given and a certain punishment was proposed. No. Most people have that idea. And unfortunately, our journalists, for reasons, as all of you know, they try and give a picture which is contrary to the law. They have come out with stories and pictures and photographs of how the mother of the, 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 the beg your pardon? Oh, sorry. Uh, how the mother of this girl who died we call her Nirbhaya. Her name is Jyoti Singh. 
funding. I was at the Chief Justice there in Delhi when this incident happened and we immediately started a, a fast track court for trying the case and it was decided very quickly by our normal standards. This question of space and time can come under some kind of management if you have control over the situation. In order to innovate, you must have the jurisdiction to innovate. Although many people have said, no, 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 no why such a, 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 a short period of time as a punishment? He was the most brutal of the lot. Who amongst you in the audience know, or even in the dais know, that he was the most brutal? Where did that come from? He was in the bus along with the others. Only those people knew what happened over there inside the bus. Every time this thing has come up, it has always hurt my conscience also. Maybe what the law is not really suited to the situation, but there are other connecting events involved. I don't know whether you've heard of a, a, a law called the Beijing Rules or a law which led to what is known as the Convention of Child Rights in 1989. I don't know whether you know about these things, but the Beijing Rules was a set of laws which were made separately for juveniles. And who were juveniles? In CRC, it is mentioned in the very first article. Any person who has not attained the age of 18 years is a child. India has not only signed the convention, it has ratified it. Can you go beyond that? Unnecessarily, first of all, the media gets a lot out of it. I don't know why and how, because the only reason is to make their sales of their paper a bit more. Look at it this way. How can you even suggest something which is not contrary, which is contrary to the law? Yes. If you amend the law, do what you like. The mother crying and saying, we expected justice, instead crime has prevailed, the criminal has prevailed. That is a totally wrong thing to say. And then to say it in public, and that being published all over in the newspapers. I think that was very sad. That was not what was really intended of the media. But yes, there is a way out which will not apply to this minor who was released yesterday. Why? Because criminal law is always prospective and never retrospective. So even if there is an amendment, amendment of what? The Juvenile Justice Act which is there already or which is going to be brought into existence defines a child as a person who is not at age, age, age of 18 years. That is the definition. How do you then come back and, and say that a person who is between the age of 16 and 18 should be tried by the adult law? But this is all, it sounds very nice and things of that sort, but unfortunately, I myself had made a statement then. When the Agitation was going on, the protest was going on near the India Gate. I wish I had been there. But to lend support to what? Not something where you can innovate and say, no, 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 let him be tried as an adult, although he is a child of under 18. You can't do these things. Yes, there is one place where innovation is allowed. Innovation where this time and space and the remedy in law becomes relevant is one article in the constitution and that power has been given only to the supreme court not to any other court article 142 it gives the supreme court the right and authority to do full justice in a pending list i myself have used it i have used this power are you familiar with Hindu law? Some of you may be. The students of law would be familiar. 
divorce in Hindu law is now something which is statutory. Section 13 provides for divorce. 13b provides for divorce by mutual consent. You know what divorce by mutual consent means? Two parties agree, husband and wife, they go to the court, they file a petition and they say that we want to be separated. There are two specific grounds given where people have not been able to stay together for a number of years. This, these are the two things where a petition under 13b can be granted. In the Supreme Court, matters came up before us and I think I was the one who innovated, I think. And I said, if a marriage has broken down irretrievably, two people have not lived together for 10 years and they cannot see each other's face, they have not remarried in such a situation, would it be proper to allow this marriage just to continue in this fashion? And I added this one particular ground where the marriage had broken down irretrievably. I said, this is also a ground, should be a ground under Section 13b for marriage of divorce by mutual consent. This has been now introduced, but then, I thought, the judge who sat with me in delivering this judgment, in a later judgment, he says, no, no, I think I was wrong. And he then said, no, this cannot be, because it is not mentioned then in section 13b, so how could it be done? He forgot that he himself had said that under article 142, this could be done. That is the power given to the Supreme Court alone to innovate. What we call substantive law. I'll give another small little example. This is a propos the thing that uh, Dr. Lang has spoken about. Because he gave us a very, let us say, a, a, a great introduction into what was the Greek law, Aeschylus, and the question of the Greek tragedies. These are all very important philosophically. And we have understood the philosophy of the law as it now stands. But unfortunately we are bound by certain statutory boundaries as a result of which we really cannot go beyond that. We have to, as I said, in innovate only at a very different stage. In the, in the Juvenile Justice Act, a, an offence which is committed, or let's, let us say even under the Indian Penal Code, Section 82 says, any kind of offence committed by a person below seven years is no offence at all. This is something which most of us don't know. Anything between seven and twelve that is also not an offence unless the person was to some extent aware of what he was doing. But then thereafter there have been very many studies as to how the brain develops and things and that is why in the Beijing rules 18 was made the age and also in child in the CRC Act uh, convention. Friends, in the Juvenile Justice Act if a child who is hungry, six, seven years old, no, I'd say not six, seven, I'd say a little, bit, little more. So even 14 years old, he's hungry. He going, he's going down the road, he sees a fruit stall. He picks up a banana and runs. He's hungry. He's 15 years old, there's nobody to look after him. He's a street child. Very well. He picks up a banana and runs. What is his crime? Theft. His crime is Indian Penal Code Section 379. Now, take another person who has swindled banks and this, that, the other are millions. He is also charged with theft. 379, the same section. Is the gravity of the offence the same? 
Is the gravity of the offense the same as to warrant same kind of punishment? No. There's a certain philosophy behind all this. And a child who has taken that banana and run, he is to be treated on a completely different level. There also innovation comes around because the magistrate has been given powers of innovation. Instead of sending him to the probation home or whatever place after conviction, there is a possibility that he can be asked to do community service. He can be asked to work in an old, old man's or old person's home. That is where the, what we call substantial justice comes in. There was a judge in, in Jharkhand, Dr. Anand Sena, Justice Anand Sena. He used to visit the jails regularly. And where he found that there were people there for minor offenses like this, he would hold court there and immediately do what had to be done in connection with the case. He's written a book on substantial justice. You get a chance to read it. So there are many, many things to talk about when you think in terms of the law, economics, time and space. The famous case, the Vodafone case, Supreme Court. Now, these are all intermingled and intermixed up. And what is really required, in my view, is a change in attitude of the social structure. The social milieu, the way it has been destroyed, and it is being permitted to be destroyed, this has to be tackled. And if you can tackle that, there's nothing like it. Sorry I took up so much of time, but I felt that maybe some kind of thing was also required to be said as far as the judiciary was concerned. <coughs> All those who are present here, the family members of <coughs> Justice Casey Basu, and uh, all those who are from the faculty and all the students. Thank you very much. And I certainly enjoyed both the two lectures which were delivered here today. And I just have to respond to one thing. As I said, it's not a debate, but just what one wanted to say. Thank you. Now the forum is open for a discussion, please. Can Take up some questions. Oh, and who are you? Well, I'm Saurav Bhattacharya. I teach labor and law and property. He doesn't know. <laughs> we are best. We are best. Since we deal with the issue of employment compensation, and one area where the temporal dimensions of law play out on a regular basis would be the notional extension of employment and the manner in which in the course of employment has been extended both spatially as well as temporally over the last 30, 40 years. And Indian Supreme Court, like on many other things, has taken a fairly progressive position on that. And very much, as you said, sort of an invisible thread that we never have really thought deeper into the broader implications of the changes that the court has made in that field. But my concern was more with relation to the interest of predictability and certainty that common lawyers speak of, and for ordinary persons governed by law, certitude would be one of the core principles that they would attach a premium to. And when I reflect on your assertions on contingency and the theory of untimely justice, and when I put that against issues of certainty and predictability, where exactly would we fit the role of a judge, especially around the debates on activism, when we look at also the concerns of predictability? On that, if I can have your thoughts on that, I would be in favor. So, thanks for two things. One, for actually giving out a concrete example. I know that uh, the talk that I gave was primarily conceptual. I was trying to build a theoretical framework. And there are, of course, a number of extremely pertinent examples, there are also contradictory examples. So and when you talk about, for example, the extension of the idea of the workplace, I and mean, you're absolutely bang on. Uh, there are other realms, I think, where this runs into somewhat of a problem. Uh, for example, when you're looking at economic, let's say, laws like patent and copyright, etc., what is an ideal you know, temporal horizon that one fixes 
So I don't think that one can have a single theory of time when it comes to the law. The question, in a way, that I was asking for was, what does it mean to actually pay a close attention to it? But on the question of predictability and its relationship to contingency, you're absolutely right that this would be the greatest concern. And I try to flag that off in terms of you know what uh, the legal pragmatists would say. And I think in relation to the recent experiences of the judiciary in India, one of the questions of the, the, has, again, been the fact that even the very principles of stare decisis in some cases have been ignored so at, towards a very perilous kind of you know, uh, to a end. Uh, but for me, at the same time, I went and asked for, in a way, an, uh, a theory of innovation, which is why I was using the example uh, of, of jazz. What does it mean to actually innovate? It means, in a way, innovation which is, in a way, within the bounds of an integrity of interpretation on the one hand, even as it is not bound by a foreclosed conclusion because it's unable to invent something new. And that's a tough one, and that's exactly what an untimely theory is demanding. Now, what does this mean in terms of evaluative criteria? The PIL moment, which for a very long time was celebrated as the birth, in a way, of a certain kind of what some people have described as you know, social action litigation, public interest litigation, or taking suffering seriously in the aftermath of the emergency, has now been read by some commentators as the bypassing of procedure, which in the late you know, 90s and early 2000s really kind of you know, undoes every element of you know, the, the social transformative nature of early PILs. And this is not so much about good PILs and bad PILs, but about what a fidelity to the law might mean. And I think that if you were to, had to really ask for a judicial theory of adjudication that is both innovative as well as you know, fidel, those are terms I don't think that we've even started discussing in the Indian context, but it not, might not be a bad time to start doing it. And I'm sure Justice uh, Althamas Kabir will have much more to say on this question. No, the question was directed towards Dr. Liang. But you know our, you would be knowing, our writ jurisdiction, the writ jurisdiction both under Article 32 and 226, it gives an opportunity to the courts, if necessary. PILs are what? They are just proceedings under 226 or Article 32? If that be so, then there is scope. There is scope of innovation in those particular uh, procedures because the writ jurisdiction does give the courts far greater uh, powers of adjustment and even thinking in terms of the the, the the remedy or the relief to be given and it been, can be done in a particular style where it could be outside the bounds of statutory law as such. That you would be knowing very well. Does that answer your question or? My worry was a little different on the point that Lawrence made huh? in terms of fidelity towards doctrines. Fidelity towards so doctrines? Not necessarily statutes but past case laws. No. And from that, that, that's right. You're right there. We have our own uh, jurisprudence with regard to case laws. And following case laws may not always may not always be absolutely sacrosanct, but as the head of the, the the judiciary at one point of time, I feel that we require this. That he brought up the question of stare decisis. This discipline is something which we have to maintain. And if you don't, then the entire jurisprudence can go here. But there is scope. Keeping in line with the tradition and yet thinking of something new, which is what he had in mind. Saurabh, if I can add one element to this, which is a very peculiar problem in the case of the Indian Supreme Court. Uh, taking from the example, let's say, of free speech disputes. A lot of, as you know, the big cases, whether it's about hate speech or about sedition, were all decided in the 50s and the 60s. And they, they were decided by nine judge benches or 11 judge benches in certain cases, like for example, Kedarnath. Yeah. Uh, in, in, and you have a problem. You're not ever going to have, in the contemporary era, benches of that size. And yet at the same time, 
So you need to innovate in a way that you can't directly overrule any of these judgments, even as you have to diminish the kind of bad political consequences of the narrow interpretation that they might have had, uh, especially on questions of proximity between speech and, and consequence, right? So in Shreya Singhal, even though it's a two-judge bench, you see them skirting around doctrinally uh, in a very interesting way, where because you cannot overrule, you have to innovate on your reading, especially bringing in you know certain kinds of cases that have historically been ignored, including, for example, Lohia, right? Which, uh, <clears throat> which for me is in some senses an innovation along with an integrity. Uh, of course, I mean this is a very very difficult one to do at some point of time. You will run into paradoxes of Avik Sarkar uh, holding that the Hicklin test is no longer applicable, but Avik Sarkar being a two-judge bench, uh, whereas Uveshi was a constitutional bench. You know, so how do we reconcile this? Will be an an issue. Yeah. But you remember what uh, you remember the Adian Jabalpur case. After the, 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 when the emergency was declared, Adrian Jabalpur said that all rights are in the constitution, including Article 21, the right to life could stand abrogated. That was one of the worst things that could have happened. Till today, that law remains on the books, but people don't agree with it. One judge in the Supreme Court, while sitting in the division bench, he did have the the innovation or the innovative sense to just simply remark that that was not good law. He didn't say anything further. Justice Osho Ganguly, he made this little comment that it's a judgment which is not acceptable and he didn't go to either overturn it or say anything further except that it was not good law. Uh, I teach here in NUJS, I'm part of the faculty and uh, I, I personally feel I'm speaking for myself and I'm sure all of the other people will agree that you know your uh, lecture has been greatly benefiting uh, intellectually and extremely extremely you know enriching ourselves on the area that you spoke. Uh, but the you know the issues that you have raised, uh, especially with you know concrete examples from you know either you know judicial decisions on piece of legislations uh, from the various you know areas, whether in uh, in imperial court with relation to section 377, you did not touch upon the section, but you are talking the referee or you know your divorce law and subsequently the two you know important areas where you mentioned about. Uh, uh, the issue of you know uh, when a poor person is visited with a serious illness, uh, the law does not either leave him uh, you know the means to you know address the cure as well as the means to end his life. So you are also at some point of time uh, I don't know uh, was trying to also you know raise this question on you know probably the issue of euthanasia and its legality. Uh, what I understood. But somewhere, I think all these issues uh, they relate to what we say in time. Uh, Victorian morality reflected in the legislative you know, philosophy, and uh, yeah, judiciary is one institution who can address uh, the change uh, because the constitution is a social document and it is not time bound. So it gives you the flexibility of time. But why not we? What what would be your you know take on the legislative process? Why don't the legislation or maybe the law commission opens up uh, its mind? Like one particular section you didn't touch, but I can reflect uh, section nine of the Hindu Marriage Act. Uh, it would it would also be a reflection of the same Victorian morality. So if we go piece by piece and judgment by judgment, we might end up into a situation like say section nine. We had an excellent judgment. Some of us believe. Uh, from the Andhra Pradesh High Court, overturned by Supreme Court. There are obviously, you know, differences of opinion. Uh, but some of us who has probably a more uh, willingness to accept human rights and the constitutional obligation in the current, you know, time and context, uh, would say Andhra Pradesh High Court was better than a Supreme Court. So uh, one way of doing it is judicial responses. But what about the legislative process? 
are we not uh, you know being seriously you know addressing these issues by looking into the whole set of laws uh, what would be your uh, you know reaction to that as a general response of course i mean when you're looking at political institutions and the you know parliament of course being supremely important on, on that count but to go to the specific examples that you mentioned we don't have very heartening uh, you know kind of news from re the recent past if you look not too long ago in fact just four days ago uh, and the less than enthusiastic response to shashi tharoor's uh, introduction of the private members bill on section 124a and on section 377 of the indian penal code you know we are talking about a situation in which a kind of a majoritarianism combined with an idea of a populism is threatening in a way to undo all of the basic procedural uh, you know safeguards that we have including the you know the proposed amendment to uh, the juna justice act and that's i think the point at which the judiciary plays a very crucial counter majoritarian role uh, and also in a way kind of conceptualizes its relationship both to a past a past that is not of an immediate political nature but to a past of a constitutional tradition or in you know the kanas foundation case where they refer not to a generic idea of morality as either societal or religious but a constitutional morality and a constitutional morality to my mind in a way is both an act of memory making but also an act of future memory and i think this is in a way the opportune kind of untimeliness of judicial politics as opposed to parliamentary politics that it's not confined and it's not restricted by a constituency in time it's restricted or it's obligated in a way to a constituency across time and that might be the distinction i feel in terms of how the temporal politics between the parliament and the judiciary actually plays out so Sorry, we don't play politics. <laughs> uh, about uh, another dimension of untimely justice uh, with the uh, its interface with the counter majority and uh, role of uh, judiciary. Uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, think about uh, the effect of unconstitutionality of statute. From which date? <laughs> that uh, this effect of unconstitutionality shall operate void ab initio or void only from the date of judgment or void only with reference to the parties to the case whether a retrospective effect is to be given or a doctrine of a prospective overruling is to be provided or whether a window period is to be given all those uh, issues uh, involve certain uh, component of uh, this uh, untimely justice as it it appears that's it. No, no, that's an observation. So, in any event, uh, the untimely justice could also be the result of various other aspects, which also include the infrastructure of the judiciary. In many places, the judge ratio is so little, so little that at times it may not be even possible to take up a case. I used to practice in the civil courts and the high court. in the civil courts would you believe it that when a suit was filed the next date that is just to uh, to ascertain whether the other party would come and contest or not would be even after one year a civil judge sitting in his jurisdiction can have as many as 60 cases on his course list daily course list and it's impossible for any human being to complete more than 20 matters because of the diverse things that he has to take up a suit when filed can involve the decision to grant an ad interim order of injunction that can take some time thereafter notice is issued then injunction that is during the pendency of the suit all these things take up so much of time and at the same time the dates are given so much later because The, the judge concerned, the presiding officer can take up 20 matters. This is my own personal experience. But the remaining 40 remain on the daily cause list. What happens to those 40 cases? They are shifted one year till one year later. These things are the untimely justice that we all talk about. And I, I felt that it was something which I felt very, very badly when I was in the Supreme Court. 
And four years prior to my becoming the Chief Justice, I had charge of what is known as the National Legal Services Authority, which of which I was the executive chairman. And this particular body was formed under an act called the Legal Services Authorities Act of 1987. And you know what was the main thing there? The main thing was the holding of Lok Adalats. Dr. Liang, uh, from what uh, I'm also making for the first time, from what uh, the Vice Chancellor said about him in the beginning, included alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. Am I right? Partially. So, would you believe it that alternate dispute resolution has resulted in Madhya Pradesh over a period of one year, the first mega Lokadalat of all the entire state, six lakhs cases were disposed of, 6.5 or something. Within three months, 13 lakh cases were disposed of. And this was all at the instance of a person who was very committed. You heard of Justice R.C. Lahoti, who was a former Chief Justice of India? Well, his brother, his younger brother K.K. Lahoti, was then in Madhya Pradesh. Third time he phoned me, he said, Sir, you will not believe it as to how many cases we dis dis disposed of in the last Lokadalat. 26 lakhs in one day. I tried to encourage this system because many of the cases were such which could be disposed of across the table within minutes. But they were stuck there because of the logjam in the main course list of the courts. These are innovations which has led to even recent in the newspapers. There was some statement from the Supreme Court that about 26 lakh cases had been disposed of throughout the country over the year. It was done in one month. In, in, in not one, one month, sorry, in nine months in Madhya Pradesh. This is an area which we all need to try and see how we can reduce our tendencies and by innovative means. Mediation has taken on, conciliation has taken on. The Arbitration Act has been enacted, has been, has been uh, replaced in 1996 and it now has a new chapter on conciliation. What is conciliation? Conciliation would amount if there is a, 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 an agreement, a decree of a civil court. Like an arbitration award can also be enforced. Same way, uh, a decree in a conciliation proceeding can be executed by the civil court. These innovations are required in order to bring legal justice within a certain time span. Any other questions? Uh, I'm Arup, uh, I yes, Mr. Haldar, I know you. Sorry, uh, I'm uh, Arup, one of the faculty members at NHS. Uh, I have a specific question to Professor Kausik Basu. Uh, uh, sir, if may I ask, uh, the question is about like whether this ultimate, uh, this uh, um, when we are speaking about justice, uh, timeliness of justice, perhaps uh, Honorable Justice Kabira said about timeliness of justice uh, uh, in India that is being taken care of by the National Court Management System now at this moment. Uh, my question is about like this, uh, untimely justice, whether it has any adverse impact on the uh, economic development of the nation, particularly developing nations, uh, in particular with India. Thank you, sir. Yeah, well, um, sure enough, um, one, for one, you need a quick resolution of certain kinds of problems. Uh, if there is a dispute, you need clarity to proceed from there onwards. I'll give you one area where we have been very involved now is um, uh, contract enforcement and the amount of time that that takes. Actually at the World Bank now we do inter-country comparison of the time that uh, that takes. A lot of business relies on contracts. You, you sign a contract, I do something for you today, you do something uh, tomorrow. If someone reneges, unless uh, there's a timely decision on that, that either there has been someone has reneged and you have to do uh, compensation for that or no, that person has not reneged. You freeze decision making in a business and it can slow down the functioning of the economy. So in this particular division of the World Bank, 
This is the only division where it, we probably have equal number of economists and lawyers working precisely because of the importance of this. You know the provisions of the Arbitration Act and contracts, as he has been pointing out, Professor Basu, that things should be within a certain limit and there should be a, a, a time sort of cap on an arbitration proceeding. But you know our Arbitration Act, you know Section 34, you know what has been added. Appeal can be preferred this, 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 this. Or if there has been any, sorry, anything which is contrary to public interest. Those two words, public interest, has now become the playing field for interpretation. And it can mean anything. What was meant to be quick has been undone by just these two words. So, sorry. Okay, so you, you understand the situation and that as a result of which any contract, suddenly in the middle somebody says I won't do it or something else will happens and then finally what happens, the entire thing gets stuck and it comes to the court, comes to the arbitral tribunals, then it comes to the courts and then something which should have been disposed of within say a week takes maybe even as long as 10 years. This is the problem. Hi, good evening. My name is Jyoti Pandey and um, I work... Your name is Jyoti Pandey? Yes. <laughs> I know. Wow. <laughs> no sing in between. No sing in between. No. Then you're different. <laughs> My question is for Dr. Leanne actually and thank you for this wonderful lecture. Um, I'm, it, you started with an example of how time won over space and uh, I'm more intrigued about actually the concept of memory that you're trying to draw out and a specific example that and you mentioned about the fragility of the individual and memory and how it interacts with justice and an example that I would like to hear your thoughts on is about the right to be forgotten which kind of looks at um, the reputation of an individual gives back the memory concept back to them in their ability to take back what people should be able to remember about them but it is about a larger question about say collective memory and how that plays out in terms of long-term justice so I'm kind of wondering how if you've thought about it and I'd like to hear about it thank you the <clears throat> right to be forgotten I mean for uh, people unfamiliar with this arose in the context of your online personality and data about you know your online presence and what happens to it in a way um, in relation to both to corporate control but also your right to be erased or what happens if you die etc and I think it is for me one of the most interesting kind of philosophical puzzles within legal theory because it brings in a way uh, into conflict a certain kind of a teleological relation that law, legal theory has always had to the question of memory um, for a very long time, the question of justice was inseparable from the question of memory, right? So the idea, especially when making uh, claims against, let's say, military states or dictatorships, was very often about what it means to remember, right? So <clears throat> the classical Kundera kind of thing, the struggle of power against, uh, the struggle of man against power, was the struggle of memory against forgetting. Uh, lent itself in a certain kind of an experience of the 20th century towards an idea of what it may mean to claim justice in memory. But I think equally, we run into the dangers, and this has been recognized when dealing with the experience of collective violence, that justice may somehow lie somewhere between too much remembering and too much forgetting. So very often when we think about, for example, the idea of what it may mean for a, a, a group or a society, after the experience of deep inequality, like in South Africa, after the experience of violence, like in many parts of Eastern Europe or Latin America, move on in terms of the ability to make the future or to invent the future, it may require an active notion of forgetting. And an active notion of forgetting is very different from a passive notion of forgetting where you are disremembered by the state. When it comes to the right to be forgotten, 
it poses all kinds of challenges because at the moment the right to be forgotten is grounded within the language of the property of the self where personality and properhood property are, are, are come together to articulate this and i don't think that's adequate i think we may need a sense of a right to privacy beyond that which is grounded in a logic of property we need to ground it much more fundamentally within ideas of dignity we need to ground it much more fundamentally in the a certain idea of a right to the integrity of the self beyond that of property curiously enough we find resonances of that in intellectual property law where celebrities have always had the right to the integrity of their personality uh, but in a somewhat kind of a crude way it might be interesting to think of what the right to the integrity of the self beyond its monetary worth might be in terms of what is the moral dignity that is affronted uh, when you want actually to be forgotten on 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 the internet so this is really a, a fascinating area but which requires in a way a far more kind of you know nuanced thinking that there is currently on it you just i thank dr lawrence lang for his beautiful lecture in this uh, 10th kc bus endogen lecture series thank you sir and on behalf of nujs i thank professor kausik basu uh, for his uh, support and providing fund to establish this uh, kc bus endogen lecture series with your support it is not possible to continue this uh, now we are doing this 10th uh, 10th uh, series of lecture so thank you sir and uh, professor kausik basu has traveled from delhi to kolkata particularly to attend this uh, <laughs> attend this lecture series and i thank uh, our honorable justice altamus kabir sir uh, for his ideas and uh, and conducting this discussion session thank you sir and i thank our honorable vice chancellor professor dr ishwar but for his initiatives and efforts in conducting this kc uh, bus endowment lecture series uh, thank you very much sir i thank all our distinguished faculty members of nujs and other distinguished faculty members of uh, other universities colleges law schools uh, uh, i thank all members of uh, kc bus uh, family of uh, for attending this uh, this series uh, thank you very much for uh, everybody and i thank all distinguished faculty members of nujs and other faculty members from other law schools law universities colleges and uh, research associates research assistants research scholars from other uh, from our university and other university and i thank all our uh, students uh, from many jays and other law schools and i thank our administrative officers for their support in organizing this program uh, i thank our uh, all uh, administrative deos and our support staffs to conduct this program finally i thank all uh, all distinguished members of uh, all members of this uh, auditorium i uh, thank you very much and i request everybody to uh, i request everybody to join for the high tea organizing in this uh, auditorium uh, please participate please give thank you very much